All right, so let's get started. So we are in the final week of our, our first module. Uh, there is still one more assignment that remains to be done. I'm going to release that uh, on Thursday. Uh, so you know, I'm just making sure everybody submits before the next part is released. Um, so to wrap up this first module, right? I'm going to give you a, a sort of a summary in the next lecture as well, but. Uh, you know, we had this detour of going very deep into nonlinear parameter estimation for a lecture and a half. So I just wanted to sort of recall and you know, make sure everybody is following uh, why we are doing what we are doing, right? So, so I hope until this point, which is also what you did for your homework uh, last week and even this week as well, uh, what we have done is we've used principles of physics to learn a specific type of modeling. Uh, uh, sort of a, a way to model uh, dynamical systems called state space modeling. And in doing so, we realize that although the structure is very intuitive and we can see how physics translates into bodies and how we can use that to predict certain things about a real system, uh, the problem really is once we have this model structure, how do we tune or identify the best values of the parameters of this model that can explain, say, real observations, right? So our model is a mathematical construct. We want it to uh, be useful in terms of predicting reality. And so that led us to this idea that uh, our model is actually nonlinear when it comes to parameters. It's linear when it comes to inputs and outputs, but it's highly nonlinear, in fact, when it comes to uh, the parameters of the model, which are the, the resistances or the conductivity and the capacitances of your, of your RC network. Uh, and so to investigate this further, right, we have to identify good values of these parameters. Uh, we, in, we then delve into this idea that the power of state space comes from the fact that you can actually predict uh, future outputs or future states of your model given the initial state and the sequence of inputs. And our model has a lot of inputs like solar radiation and outside temperature, whatnot. But if I have like a forecast of these disturbances and I have some value of these inputs, which I would if I was measuring everything, then we would want to use our knowledge of state space propagation of states, uh, essentially what is shown on this slide here. Right? So I hope you recall that. And so we, we then ended up using this powerful uh, characteristics of LTI state space models to define this vector uh, of all outputs. So now if we are given some measured outputs of zone temperature, we can um, specify the predictions of our model of the zone temperature as a function of the parameters of the model. And we use that to specify a sum of squared errors. And then the rest of the discussion is, uh, well, how do we actually minimize the sum of squared errors with respect to the parameters of the model, right? That's where we, uh, we sort of uh, had this tangential discussion, hopefully useful on why and how these nonlinear uh, least square estimators work. Okay, so, so this is where we stopped last time. I gave you a, a sort of a reprise of all of these different methods and how they work, what is the advantage limitation of one versus the other. Um, so to just wrap up that part, I, because I went over it very fast towards the end of the previous lecture. You don't have to write your own optimizer. I've said this previously as well. So what you will end up doing in the in the next assignment is we give you a data set, right? In fact, one of the extra credits is can you create your own data set in Energy Plus? But we'll give you a data set and you have a model structure, so you will run a parameter estimation algorithm uh, within MATLAB, right? So if everything so far has been in this tool, it just makes sense to continue that way. So talking about MATLAB in particular, it has many, many different ways to do a parameter estimation or you can even call it system identification. I've just shown some of the possible ways. In fact, all three of them could work for a problem. They are all optimizers that can do nonlinear least squares uh, regression. That is what NLMS is, nonlinear least squares. Uh, so I'm going to give you one example of how that would be set up and how it works in MATLAB and it will become very relevant for this last assignment that uh, will be released later this week. So, you can ignore the outputs for the time being. Let's just look at what this function is doing, right? So, the problem of nonlinear parameter estimation is we need a model. We need some initial guess of the parameters. 
and we need a way to generate predictions of the model so, so that we can compute the sum of squared errors. If we can do all of these things, then the Levenberg, Marquette, or Gauss, Newton, or whatever optimization algorithm is being used, it will do the rest of the searching for us automatically, uh, provided we you know, feed it the correct sort of configuration. So that's what this function does, this nlin fit nonlinear uh, regression uh, function. It needs input the set of all, uh, one of the arguments is the set of all inputs to the model, right? So uh, we are given some data, some observations of zone temperature, neighboring temperatures, solar, outside temperature, everything which is an input in your vector that you submitted that is being provided to us using some sensor measurement from energy plus in our case. Then we are also given the ground truth value of the response, right? The response in our case is the zone temperature. And the goal of parameter estimation for our problem is find the best values of the RCs that explain your true observations, which is this y vector in the arguments. Right, so we are given the set of predictor variables, which is, you know, something like this. It may not have all the ones which are listed here, but I know you by now have gotten used to this uh, sort of notation of what these mean. And then we are given the response variable. So what do we need next for parameter estimation? We need a way to generate this prediction vector of our state space model. Right? So this, this will help the estimation algorithm to compute the sum of squared errors for a given value of parameters and then decide how to update the parameters to reduce the sum of squared errors. Right? So this is done using um, something which is now becoming MATLAB specific. So the discussion is no longer general. So I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, sort of uh, uh, argument passing before, but here we are passing, so this is a function, nonlinear fit is a function in MATLAB, and one of the arguments to that function is a function itself. Okay, so usually in coding you just pass some parameters or arguments to a single function. In MATLAB, you can pass an entire function as an argument to another function, and that's done using this at the rate of symbol. So you can read more about it in the in the actual worksheet and MATLAB documentation as well. But essentially, this part of the argument is making sure that for a given value of parameters, so th is my notation for parameters because it's uh, abbreviation for theta. Uh, so given a value of theta and given the inputs for uh, however many samples, uh, this is going to calculate the end outputs of the model. And then return return back uh, that sum of squared errors to nonlinear fit. Okay, so that's one of the one of the things that you will actually work on in your worksheet. Then we also need the initial guess of our parameters. That's also an argument to our uh, you know, uh, and then fit function. So we have already seen what this can look like. You can have 15, 14, 11, 20, however many parameters based on the uh, state space structure of the model. So we have to pass that. And finally, uh, it's not shown here, but when you say options here, this is where you can even specify properties of the Levenberg Marquette algorithm. So you can go and control the, the lambda rate or some property of how often to switch between the two competing uh, uh, steepest descent or gross the methods, if you choose to do so, okay? So this is just a brief overview of what you will end up using or something similar to this, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, before I jump into the remaining topics. So to wrap up this module, you know, uh, each of these topics, again, requires its own detail uh, or could be its own detailed semester-long course. Uh, especially uh, topics of experiment design and model predictive control. Uh, but again, that's not the, the main point of this course. In this course, we want to learn about a domain, we want to learn about a modeling principle and how it applies to a real world problem. So our domain was energy, our type of model was physics-based state space, and we have learned how to now uh, estimate the parameters of any state space model, whether it's building energy related or not. But to kind of close the loop, which is what Cyberphysical Systems is about, on this first module itself, I will go a little bit into some um, very nearest neighbor topics to what you already know. Um, may not, it might not be in sufficient rigor and mathematical depth as the other stuff we've looked into, but 
uh, as someone who may be using state space models or first principles, uh, it, should, it should be clear how you have to uh, validate your model or what do you mean by sensitivity and uncertainty in your model. Because these were some of the questions which you already brought up while we were discussing the uh, sort of principles of modeling in this first part. And then the, in the remaining last lecture of uh, this module, we mostly focus on model predictive control because that's where we started from. This idea that uh, people are drinking too much tea in the afternoon, which is causing the surge, and we trickle that down to modeling the building itself. So I'll bring that back on how the state space model will actually be used for controlling buildings, right? So we haven't talked much about control so far. All right, so let's just jump right in. We we'll begin with the first sort of very brief overview of what model validation means in our uh, in our in the context of this model. And you may have seen some of this before, but this is just a refresher, and it will also help you in your in your next assignment. So really the question is, how do I know that my model is any good? I have done all this work of creating the structure, estimating nominal values by looking at IDF file or building data or whatever. And now, uh, let's say we have also done the parameter estimation. Uh, how do we know we've ended up with a, with a good model? Right, so qualitatively, we have to define what is good here. Right, so we have to agree on what is the notion of good. And the notion of good can only be defined if we have to recall what was the model designed to do. So in our case, we had a single zone and the model is meant to be able to predict the evolution of zone temperatures subject to various disturbances and internal heat gates. So good here is just a measurement of how accurate is this prediction from that model. Right, so if you're, uh, this is sort of an obvious point, but sometimes I have seen uh, that researchers just lose sight of what they were designing for and how they are evaluating the model. So, so we have to just, you know, go back to this usefulness of the model. Like I said, many, many times this course is about building useful models. Uh, so we have to just measure how good our model is and, uh, you know, we, we can predict the responses of a model for, let's say, some optimal value of theta star. So theta star is the output of your parameter estimation now. So given some good values of your parameters, where good is again a measure of how well was it able to reduce the sum of squared errors. Uh, you want to really know or compute, not qualitatively, not just eyeballing these uh, prediction versus ground truth plots, but you want some coherent quantitative measurements, if, especially if you are, want to compare different models. Right, so uh, I'll give an example that I gave you a, a template for what was my RC structure. And let's say we want to compare it to some other RC structure or 30 different RC structures. We can't just eyeball 30 different plots and see which one is closest. So uh, some of these um, goodness of fit criteria or accuracy criteria you already are familiar with. So we'll not uh, spend too much time over. But then I want to introduce some of them that you may not have thought about, uh, about before. Right. So the, the, the problem is if we have a prediction and we have the ground truth trajectory, uh, what is a good criteria to uh, evaluate how how good our uh, sort of the prediction accuracy is in this case. So the, the one which is most popular, and I, I, I would assume many of you have seen it already, is called root mean squared error. Um, so we've already seen what sum of squared error is. It's the ground truth value or the measurement minus your prediction. You take the, uh, the square of that to you know, adjust for whether it's a positive error or a negative error, and then you sum across all your samples. So this is sum of squared errors. You divide it by the number of samples. This gives you the mean squared error, and you just take the square root of that. And this will give you an idea of the average error in your model with respect to the ground truth. Okay, this is what RMSC is. Um, just so that it's a sanity check again for me, how many of you have seen this before? So I can adjust how far okay. So people have seen this. I will go much faster. So the, the next question is, how do you capture, so RMSE is a, is a measure of what you can call as the bias of your model, or how close you are to the ground truth. One another question you may want to ask is, how much are you able to capture the variability of your ground truth data? Does the model describe the variation of your samples, the spread of the samples uh, equally well or not? So since you've all seen RMSE, can someone suggest how do you measure this quantity. 
the accuracy of the variance of a model. What's a good metric for this? Has anyone seen this before? Yeah. You're nodding your head. Deviation. So standard deviation is is just this quantity, pretty much, right? So you have your true measurements, and you can see how are they spread around the set, the mean of those measurements. But that's not what my question is, right? So standard deviation is a property of data. What is the evaluation criteria that you can use to assess whether the model that you have is also has a similar standard deviation or not? Yeah, R squared. Very good, right? So, so, so the, the this property is called coefficient of determination. It's essentially, if you look at, let me rephrase because you know, if someone has I haven't seen this, let me just spend uh, thirty seconds on this. What is this quantity? Look at this expression. It's the difference between the value of each of your measurements and the mean of the observations. There is no model dependent part here. We can just compute it without a model. So, if from statistics, we actually know this expression is for the standard deviation. The square root of this is the standard deviation as described in statistics. So you can think of this quantity as the spread of the data around its own mean. And this spread is what we can interpret as the variance. So in a similar mathematical equivalent, the sum of squared errors can be thought of as how well is the predicted value close to the sample mean. Or how well can we explain this variance of the data from our model itself? So we can define a very simple metric, which is just the ratio of these quantities. And this ratio, since this is an error term, this ratio is how much error in the data cannot be explained by my model. That's the interpretation of the sum of squared errors. So if this ratio is the ratio of the variance or error, which is not explained by the model, 1 minus this ratio becomes how much of the variation can you actually explain by the model. Okay, so this quantity of 1 minus the ratio of the sum of squared errors divided by the essentially the standard deviation square is called R squared or coefficient of determination. And the way to interpret this is that for a given prediction and given ground truth, you can compute R squared and if it is close to 1, then your model not only is accurate because your sort of you know sum of squared error is low, uh, it's also being able to capture a lot of the variance in the data. Okay, so it's just the brief description of this. So when your error is low, this term is very less compared to one, which is why you can explain a lot of the variance of this. Right, so we have R M S C, we have R squared, and then the final, again very popular one is just R M S C, but we normalize it. So so why do we do that? So let's say I give you a model A and I say that the root mean square error, square error of this temperature prediction is 0.3 degrees. What does that tell you about how good this is? Where is this 0.3 degrees coming from? Is it across 10,000 samples, a million samples or just two samples? Because if your error is half a degree between 10 samples, that's a pretty bad error or it's a you know, large amount of error. But if your cumulative mean squared error across a million samples is half a degree, then your model is actually very accurate. Therefore, a better metric than root mean squared error is normalized root mean squared error where you want a dimensionless quantity, right? So root, root mean squared error always has the same units as the output variable. So it's degree Celsius or watts or whatever. So we need a dimensionless metric to tell us how good is the fit of my prediction compared to ground truth and therefore we normalize root mean square error either using the range of values of our uh, ground truth or even using sometimes the uh, sort of the sample uh, mean of the ground truth. You can use either or uh, as long as you just consistently use the same. So what this tells me is, you can now obtain things like, or make remarks such as, my model is uh, x percent accurate. Because now you can denote the accuracy of your model in a dimensionless metric, rather than dependent on the output response. 
Okay, so so once again, this is just a refresher. It's not really you know uh, a lot of new new knowledge or new concepts. Uh, but once again, this tool that you have been using makes it very easy to compute all of this. So you have a function called goodness of it. You pass it your predicted response and the ground truth, and then you specify which one of these metrics do you want to use, and it will just tell you the value of that without having to, you know, compute these things yourself. All right, is this, is, is this part clear? So this is how we will determine how accurate your models are based on one of these criteria. Uh, I would highly suggest that you use uh, normalized root mean square error. And you can also report R square values. They are very useful. Okay, so that was a very, very fast uh, but hopefully, you know, just a refresher of what these quantities are, and they are widely used in machine learning statistics, and they're also relevant to our state space predictions. Uh, so let me jump ship into a slightly different uh, concept of uh, how do you analyze characteristics of the model once you've trained it. And I'm going to give you a, a real-world example, sort of how I, uh, you know, use the same example as. I've been using before of this building in Philadelphia that we did this modeling for. Uh, so I'm going to show you firstly what is sensitivity analysis and how is it actually useful for real world uh, uh, kind of a decision making. Okay, so we go back to this question. We've answered qualitative, quantitatively how we can measure if the model is any good. But one of the things that we may want to investigate about our model is the following. that how does the output of the model change or to what extent does the output of the model change if I change say one of the inputs and everything else is the same or if I change one of the parameters and everything else is the same. In fact, if you recall, the reason why we can do this parameter estimation is because well, but when we take the derivatives of the model with respect to parameters you can figure out how the output will change with respect to each of the parameters and this is the knowledge which is being used to compute uh, some kind of a, a optimal direction or gradient to change those parameters but you can also do that with inputs right so you can define a, a, a quantity where the sensitivity of the model is how much does the output change for every unit change in either the parameter or the input and everything else is the same. So, sub, so this is like a disclaimer, subject to all things being the same, we can evaluate this dependency of the output to each of the inputs and to each of the parameters. And this is what is called uh, sensitivity analysis. And so uh, right now this is again a qualitative description or just an intuition of what this is. Uh, let me give you an example of where this might be uh, useful actually. So, I'm going to skip this slide and just jump to this plot. Um, yeah, this is the first plot of the day. You know, they say that every, every time you show a plot, you will lose 10% of the audience. Uh, I have about 12 of these, so I hope this can stick to me. So, so what is this plot? This is telling us how does the average estimated energy demand of a building change when you start changing the values of some of the parameters of the model or some of the inputs of the model, right? So, so the slope of this line, let's say heat gain, tells us if the heat gain was to increase by 20%, 40% or decrease by the same amount, what, would, what is the intended consequence on the energy consumption, assuming everything else in the model doesn't change? That's sensitivity, right? So you can do that for different attributes of the model, for inputs as well as parameters. And this can give you insight as to which parts of my model are the most influencing quantities that determine how my output changes. Why would this information be useful? So before I go to the slides, the intuition is if I know that out of these 20 parameters or 10 inputs, here are the prime suspects which will influence my output the most, I might want to invest in better sensors for just those quantities because they influence the model output the most. I might not care about improving the measurement or uncertainty of some radiative gain that has 
already hard to measure because it doesn't really impact or doesn't have that high sensitivity in my model. So this deeper investigation of the sensitivity of your model to inputs and parameters gives you that insight to make decisions about how to improve models, how to account for what is causing my error to increase or decrease the most. Where should I spend my energy trying to improve the accuracy of the model? Okay, so, so you can interpret the same thing if you want to like, you know, interpret the slope of these things. So let's look at maybe uh, one which we understand. So this seems to be the conductivity of the wall. I'm not sure which wall, external or internal, but this uh, light blue line, the slope of this line tells me how sensitive is the energy consumption or the output of this particular model with respect to the value of the conductivity of the thermal resistance of the wall. Right, so we can reduce all of this information as this coefficient, sensitivity coefficient or influence coefficient, which is simply the percentage change in the output per percentage change in the input. Yes. Sorry, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Why, why are they all uh, linear? I mean, is it just an example or? This is just an example and very good observation. I'll show you in a second that this is really not always the case. So let me repeat the question, it was that why are all these lines such a simple linear relationship? Um, this is just an example, or someone has linearized the nonlinear. I'm really not sure, I borrowed this from, uh, from existing literature. So let me give you a real world impact of what I've been describing. You know, why would you care about sensitivity? So, so here's one idea, right? So in order to train a good model, I need good data from my actual building. Okay, if I if I am not able to measure these internal gains or even surface temperatures or outside temperatures accurately, then I I cannot really account for all those disturbances in my model itself. So it's very intuitive to think of this that the placement of sensors and the density of sensors in your plant. And your, this could be you know not even a building, but in this context we are just going to look at a building itself. The sensor placement and density will give us a richer resolution of what is happening in my plant, which will allow me to potentially train models of higher accuracy. So very loosely, you have the spectrum of model accuracy and how that is a function of sensor placement and density. Right. So uh, uh, if you have more sensors, better data, better models. However, most buildings today are actually on the poor model end of the spectrum. They're not very well instrumented. Because you know they have very basic instrumentation. Maybe this building is not a good example because we do have a very extensive SCADA system that you have seen before. But many real world buildings, especially commercial buildings, which are small and medium sized, just think about it. If you are a medium sized building or a small commercial building owner, um, would you really invest like hundreds and hundreds thousands of dollars uh, just to build a better model for everybody. Right? Many people would have a very natural sort of uh, resistance against that sort of investment. Uh, also because it's not clear, you know, you save some percentage of your bill potentially if you do control. So your retrofitting of the building and adding sensors, it's very far in this sequence of things uh, and it manifests its sort of uh, effect on energy savings. It's very, very far away from that effect. Right, so, so it's this domino effect that we do expect. If you have more sensors, you can have a better model, you can do better control and save you more money. But establishing that intuitively and directly is quite hard. And that's actually one of the problems why we won't, don't have too many smart buildings today. Because, uh, because of this, accuracy costs money and how accurate do you want it? Right, so, so if you have more sensors, you can better analyze this trade-off between data quality from those sensors and the quality or the accuracy of the model that you do. Right, so that's one of the reasons where the sensitivity analysis can uh, shed some light or lead the way as to where is the best bang for your buck in terms of adding new sensors to an existing plan. Right, so uh, in this picture, which is a little bit blurred, it just shows that a single room has two thermostats on the opposite side of the same pillar. Right, so is it really necessary or are they giving me some additional information that otherwise may not have been possible? 
So we want to use tricks and knowledge about model sensitivity to inform decisions about actual physical sensor placement uh, and the number of sensors as well. Right? So this is just one aspect. If you look at this high level question of sensor data quality and uncertainty, uh, only one of them is that there is uncertainty or models can become inaccurate due to placement of sensors and the number of sensors. So in this again hand-picked uh, exaggerated example, there's a thermostat which is located above the toaster. And this thermostat controls the HVAC operation of the entire room. So if someone is using the toaster, then the HVAC thinks that something has just gone wrong and they start reacting. So maybe the sensor was not ill placed, just the usage of the uh, of that area was not informed. What could be another reason to uh, assess data quality or can affect data quality? The, uh, another obvious one is just the accuracy of the sensor itself. Right, so I've said this before that there's a specialized high fidelity sensor called the paranometer which can cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars to measure the solar irradiance. That's why we usually just have one on each side. We don't need one on every wall because it's expensive. So you have a design choice whether you want an expensive high fidelity reading of your solar or do you want a cheap light dependent resistor that can also give you some estimate of the incident solar. The effect will be in the quality and the accuracy of the data. So again, we may want to see how does the model or the accuracy change when we uh, uh, when there is uncertainty in the solar input stream. And that, that is again going, up, going back to model sensitivity. And then there's other reasons too, right? So uh, to estimate internal heat gain, you may need to estimate the number of people in the room, so, you know, uh, some sim single uh, infrared sensor or passive IR sensor may not give us that information. And it's again uh, a source of uncertainty. So how do we account for this in the models that we have built? So we all know what this picture means by now. Right? We build this model, we have a lot of inputs and disturbances into these, uh, into these models. Um, and so you have built the state space equivalent of that, you do parameter estimation, the summary of all of what you have done so far is just this, okay? That you have a model structure, which is this state space network. You have a parameter estimation algorithm, let's say 11 big Markwit. And if you fix both of these things, then you can exclusively analyze the influence of the uncertainty or data quality on the accuracy of the model or on the output of the model. So that's what we want to do. That's what sensitivity analysis allows you to do. Given a model, you can fix everything, which is the model structure and the estimation algorithm, and exclusively study that the only thing that I'm going to vary is how much uncertainty is present in my input data, and then I'm going to evaluate how does that influence the accuracy of my model. Another thing I want to comment on, since this appears on this slide, is this say the title is the accuracy of an inverse model. So you will find um, this description and sometimes in literature where people distinguish models not just in terms of gray box, white box, or black box, sort of what we have discussed before, but they also categorize models as forward models or inverse models. So forward model, you can think of energy plus being a forward model because all you do is specify some values in the IDF file and it uses physics to automatically simulate the response. An inverse model is sort of the gray box model that you have learned, where you have a model structure but you are estimating the values of the parameters of that model from real data. So you have to do this sort of uh, you know, inverse step. So you're not really simulating or predicting uh, values directly from the get-go. You first have to measure, estimate the parameters, and then use the model for prediction. That's why sometimes people call this as an inverse model. So is the construct clear on what we want to do? We want to analyze the effect of input-output data on model accuracy. So how do we do that? Here's an idea. So I'll mostly use pictures. So this is all the input data or the measurement data that we have. Right? And what you have done or will, will do in the next assignment is 
you will use an estimation algorithm to train a model that will predict temperatures. And you can evaluate how accurate that is using a normalized mean square error or group mean square error. So we do that. This is always what we do. And this is the you know, sort of the parameter estimation step. Then what we can do is for the same input data, we can pick one input stream or variable. And I will create n copies of the same data where the only thing different is I have introduced some noise or uncertainty in that variable or some bias in either direction or however I choose to do so. So the only thing different about these artificial data sets is the value of this single input stream. Everything else is still the same. <laughs> what we can do next is we can use these n artificial data sets and train n different models using the same parameter estimation algorithm. So this is the part where everything else is the same. And the only thing different about these n models is that they were trained on a data set where only one input was different. And now we can compare the accuracy of these models to our sort of you know, baseline model on some test data. And this will give us a measurement of how does the uncertainty or bias in my cooling rate affect the accuracy of my model compared to baseline. So in a, in a sense, we are computing the sensitivity coefficient between how does the accuracy of my model change as I introduce uncertainty artificially into one of the inputs. And then you repeat this for all the inputs. So the fine print here is that we are assuming that all these inputs are independent from each other. So you can independently vary them without having to worry about other inputs. And that might not always be that straightforward. Okay, so this is the high level idea. Uh, let me give you an example of how this how this works in the uh, in the real world. So uh, before that, this is a, another opportunity for me to tell you about Energy Plus was an open source building simulator. There's another simulator called Transis. It stands for Transient Systems. Um, so this has a more simulink like interface if you know many people are more comfortable with just drag drop drag and dropping uh, uh, kind of library components and determining how the building works so you can do that in transis uh, but i won't go into details of how that works here so point is we have a, a building in transis and uh, we have some data uh, input data which i think is also mentioned here or uh, maybe not Okay, we have several inputs. I'm not mentioning uh, which ones they are. Uh, the output is zone temperature, and then we have you know 12 RC parameters. Uh, so this is my kind of baseline model, where uh, this is simply a model that was trained on this data in June, and I'm testing the accuracy of the model using I think RMSC uh, in July. So that has some value of uh, 0.18 degrees. The R square is pretty high close to 1, which means it's capturing the variability as well, and it's also consistent if we just eyeball the predictions, it's pretty consistent with the peaks and values. So then what we do is for each of the inputs, we artificially perturb them by adding 10% bias, 20% bias, or uncertainty, and we do this for every input one at a time, and then look at how does the accuracy of the model change with respect to this baseline. And so, this is another plot, so I hope you are still with me. Let me walk you through what you are seeing here. Don't worry about if you can read the x and y axis. The y axis of each of these plots is how does the model accuracy change with respect to the baseline. Each of these plots corresponds to a different input stream. So this is ambient temperature, this is external solar. And so the shape of this plot is telling you if there was 5% or 10% error in my ambient temperature, how would the model accuracy increase or, or model error increase? So you can see for most of them, in introducing more error or bias tends to increase the error of the model and in a non-linear fashion as one would expect. Because each of these each of these samples is generated by training a state space model on a batch of data in which only that particular 
input stream had a particular percentage of perturbation added to it. Right, so you are seeing around maybe 500, even more of uh, such uh, simulations in this uh, uh, sequence of plots. But what you can interpret this is how is the normalized mean square error change, the, or what is the change in model accuracy um, as it relates to the magnitude of perturbation in each of the streams. And once we do that, we have enough information to compute a uh, coefficient which will tell me what is the uh, percentage change in accuracy for every percentage unit input perturbation, which is what we've been discussing as uh, what is called model sensitivity coefficient. So why would you use it? You can use it now to rank order inputs which influence your model accuracy the most. So let, let me pause here because we went over quite a lot of stuff. Uh, are there any questions on what, what was the goal, what was the intuitive method, and how we interpret the output? See some confused faces. So you can ask questions. <laughs> is it clear what this part is trying to show? The y axis is trying to tell us how will the accuracy of your state space model change for every 1% or 1 unit of uncertainty in the respective input data. So in this picture, the accuracy of my model is highly sensitive to the HVAC input, the outside temperature and solar and internal heat gain, and not so much to ground temperature. And this is based on this empirical analysis of perturbing and doing this exploration for every possible outcome, assuming that they are independent. Okay, so we can repeat this for this real building that uh, I have used time and again for this reference. Um, and once again, for simplicity, I'm only going to look at one zone. We actually did it for the entire, entire building. Um, so in this real building, you know, um, this was the training data on which, which was used to identify the nominal values of the parameters through end and fit. Uh, this is my testing data. So this constitutes as my baseline model. Right? Where I look at the different input streams, uh, and I'm just evaluating what's the best possible uh, model accuracy for the data that we measure. Then we perturb each of those inputs in some range, nominal range, in some sort of specified range, and look at how does the accuracy of the model change. So this is the same plot, but this time it's not from a simulator, but a real bit. So here is actually a more sort of a, uh, you know, interpretable view. Uh, some of the variables you can see they have a very steep response around the nominal zero value. So anytime you deviate in the positive or negative direction around the zero value, you are artificially introducing some noise or uncertainty in your input stream. And so the steeper this response, the higher the sensitivity of the accuracy to that variable. And so you can see there somewhere it's almost a flat line. Right? So that means that the accuracy of the model is not that sensitive to that particular thing. So once again, this has the same uh, X and Y interpretation, and so for real data for that building, we see that the zone temperature, the porch temperature, so this is not plenum, this is porch for that building, uh, and once again, sort of the HVAC uh, cooling load influence the accuracy of the model the most. So what we observe in simulation is also consistent with how it works in the real world for an actual building. So it may not be so. It may not be still be clear on why is this actually useful. Right? I have I've qualitatively tried to reason that you can use this to make decisions about where to place sensors and what to do. So let me actually show you one such example where we use this information to tell us or inform us where to place sensors in a building. Okay. So so let's look at the implication of this. So the zone that I just showed you the model for in that building is this area. So let me ask, a, uh, I've said this before, but let's revisit this question of 
if I give you four sensors or five sensors, temperature sensors, and ask you to measure the temperature of this room, where would you place them? Or forget that it's even five. I tell you, use as many sensors as you want, tell me what the temperature of this room is. What would you do? What, how would you go about doing that? I mean, I would put one like kind of far away from the doors or places where possibly like the temperature would fluctuate a lot. So like for example, maybe that like corner over there. Okay, so you want to place it away from disturbances and isolate it so that it's not affected by some you know, external activity or uh, something which is not inherent to how this room operates. Uh, it's a meaningful approach. The underlying question here is, what is the temperature of a space? Right? And we've discussed this before that you can never actually measure the true temperature of the space. You can only make point measurements. Therefore, it becomes important to see if wherever you have decided to put the real thermocouple or the thermostat, is there any bias in that measurement of the thermostat compared to, let's say, a mean of uniformly placed sensors or, or you know, you can place sensors based on how the room is being used, where most occupants are. If that's what HVAC is trying to do, it's trying to optimize comfort. So the reference signal or the error signal to the HVAC is the temperature of the zone. So in this case, the thermostat is located uh, on this wall, this green square is the thermostat, which is near the entrance of the zone. But this is a very big area, it's actually maybe like five times uh, the space that we have here in this lecture hall. And so what we noticed was that they were, we placed other temperature sensors almost like uniformly all around the zone. And so these are real pictures from this zone, they are poor resolution, but you get the idea. And then we also had a special measurement, so we had a portable cart with this vertical rod and this rod also had around a dozen temperature sensors. So not only do we care about sort of the 2D view of temperature distribution, we also had a way to measure 3D uh, view of the temperature profile and we could move the cart and leave it there for six months and get a good data and then move it again. And so the question arose that is there a significant bias between, let's say, what the thermostat reports and what the mean of all these sensors is? Right? Because the thermostat is the one which is being used to actually control the zone. So we want to study that. Um, and so you can just, you know, look at the history of all these temperature measurements, take the mean of them, and then compare them with the thermostat. Right? So on the x-axis is probably uh, for a year or so, all of thermostat measurements, this is the distribution of those measurements. On the y-axis is the distribution of the mean. And so you can see this band actually denotes that there is some bias, right? So it's not a true representative as one would expect in any large space of what would be considered as the uniform or the mean temperature of that space. And uh, just skipping some of these analysis, you could fit uh, like a you know a Gaussian curve around this uncertainty to measure this extent of the bias. What we found was that um, there's about one percent bias between what the thermostat reports and what the mean is. And so naively, you can dismiss by saying one percent is like nothing, right? Especially in maybe like 0 0.2, 0 0.5 degrees. How does it matter? The extent to how it matters comes from our sensitivity analysis. Because the zone temperature actually is the most influential thing. One percent bias in the zone temperature can influence the accuracy of our models by more than 20%. And this could only be discovered if you had done a sensitivity analysis on your model. So there is merit in doing sensitivity analysis because it directly informs you. And I have skipped the Part, this is a research project, so I skip the part where we can actually now go back and revisit and determine what's the best placement of the thermostat to reduce this bias. Right? So that's how you close the loop with sensitivity analysis. So, so hopefully that was a, it's a very domain specific example, but it would 
encourage you that if you ever build a state space model uh, for any physical system and you do the estimation of the parameters, it's always a good idea to do a sensitivity analysis for your model. It's not just enough to do validation and stop there. Uh, and this is how you would do that, and here's one example where it actually is useful in the real world. Okay? All right, so finally, let's sort of wrap up today's lecture by one last topic I want to introduce. And let me motivate that, right? So, so here is a profile of the zone temperature measurement shown in orange, the outside temperature shown in gray, and I think this is the energy consumption for, for some month in some building. We don't care where it is. So, what I want you to notice is that the zone temperature across a single month is more or less constant. It doesn't really change that much. Can someone quickly tell me why that could be the case? Why is the zone temperature like a flat line almost? And that's what you're trying to track, right? Very good, right? So that's the whole purpose of the HVAC. The more flat this is, the better your HVAC is functioning. Because it's rejecting disturbances or heat very, very efficiently. Right, so I think this might be, in, in uh, based on the outside temperature profile, this might be during summer when you are reaching like 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and then during winter when the temperature is near zero and you are using a lot of heating energy, it's still a flat line. So, and this is like a very you know, toy level or a high level abstract view. If we zoom into any one of these days, it would look something like this, right? Where, uh, you have the red line, which is the room temperature. It's almost a flat line. Uh, the outside temperature also didn't vary much. But you can see the HVAC, which is the airflow and the supply temperature and the fresh the supply airflow and the fresh influx of the air outside. There's a lot of activity which is responsible for keeping this flat. So here's the question. If you use this data, this input-output data, to train your state space model, would it be a good idea to use that model in the bio, right? So, is it a good idea to train a model when your value of the response doesn't change much? Or what do you what do you think is the limitation when you train a model on data where the temperature doesn't even change? So you have the similar observations most of the time. So what would be a limitation of such a model? So let me repeat that. In the parameter estimation, we need measurements. Those measurements will dictate, dictate how good our estimates of the parameters are. So there's nothing wrong about this data. You can train an RC model to fit and explain and predict such temperature outputs. But your model has been restricted because of the nature of the training data to only observe a very controlled environment where, let's say, for some reason, the outside temperature just increases abruptly for some reason, whether it's due to a sensor failure or whatever. Your model hasn't seen that before. So even though it's a physics-based model, it will generate some prediction of how it thinks the RC values and based on the sensitivities, how that will propagate to the model output. But within the training process, the values of the RC parameters themselves have never been subjected to this excitation of your building, in some sense. And that's a limiting factor. This, this will cause our model to lose its generality. And the whole point is, can we train a model that we can use and deploy in the wild, and when the demand response request occurs, it should be able to predict how the building would behave at the extremes, not just as business as usual. It's easy to predict this. You don't need a state space model. Just fit a straight line and you can predict the temperature at any point. Right? So, so we need this excited inputs or we need more variability in our training data in order to train a model that will generalize well. And this is a concept which is universal to all of modeling, not just state space. If you've taken machine learning, you know this very well. 
this is what is called, you know, uh, your model is not being generalizing well because it hasn't observed certain situations that occur in the feature space. So if you look at this real world building that I modeled before, you can ask, how did you learn this model? And by how did you learn, I don't mean to say what was the sequence of steps, but if we look at the features or the inputs, so this particular graph shows us how the air handling unit energy consumption, which is primarily due to its span, changes during my training period. Also, if you look carefully, look at the time at which we were running the training at 1 in the morning when there was nobody in the zone. So what I'm trying to say is that in order to generate a generalizable model, you need to have input output data which covers different excitation modes of your real system. So literally during nights and weekends, we had to artificially increase the airflow increase the supply air temperature to some weird ranges so that we have the observed response or observed output in terms of the zone temperature and how it gets affected. So this is artificial sort of perturbation that we have to induce into the system. There's some natural perturbation as well. Right? So solar irradiation is zero during the night and like at 7.30 a.m. you have a spike in the radiance activator. Right? So, so this, this, by the way, this particular way of exciting a plant in a building is called functional testing. It's a field of its own. But why do, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because the next question arises, is this the best way to excite the building? Or how did you choose this se random sequence? Right? So you, you can question what is the optimal way to trigger an excitation of my plant such that I can end up with the most generalizable, useful model. Right? It's a very loaded question and it's one which is very hard to answer, but in the next 10 minutes I'm going to give you some idea of how do we answer such questions. Is the question clear? Because otherwise the remaining 5-10 minutes are not going to be that insightful. Right? My question is, First of all, does everybody agree that if you train on data where nothing changes, it's not a very good model? Because anytime there would be any change, your model will have a large error in the prediction. So to fix that, we can we, I cannot control the solar radiation outside. So what I can do is, for some of the control variables, we artificially excite it. We do some pseudo-random uh, you know, bang-bang control or some input sequence that we inject into the plant to observe how the output of the zone temperature varies when there's a lot of excitation in my in my inputs. And so the so, so does everybody agree that that's necessary or it's a good idea in general? And now the question I'm asking is on top of that, how do you decide what is the good sequence to excite your plant? Okay, so that's the setting of the next sort of five minutes. So let me give you the results first and then I'll show you how to, to, to actually do this. Right? So on the left hand side you have the zone temperature or the set point of the zone temperature. The green and the red are the upper and lower limits of the set point during a couple of days. Right? So I think this is maybe five days or so. So you can see that when your zone is occupied you have a tighter comfort band. When it's not occupied your band is larger. Right? The band is the difference between the lower and the upper limits. And the black line actually tells you what the zone temperature was. Uh, during business as usual operation. So uh, what has been shown here is that anytime the zone is occupied, your temperature is more or less around 20 degrees because of the HPAC function. So if you train a model to predict zone temperature with this setup, you will always just want to predict 20 degrees unless some new facilities manager comes and changes, changes the set point, your model has no idea how to react outside of this 20 degree range. So what we end up doing is design an excitation signal, so which is this black line that is more, you know, has a more sort of a design to it rather than always being at 20. So here we are artificially changing the set point of the zone so that we can observe some input output response of the model uh, and we train our state space model based on this data on the right side. And in fact, we show that the model trained on this 
optimally trained model is more accurate than a conventionally trained model compared to baseline. Right, so we, we can already do this, but let me give you an overview of how we do this. So, so far in our story, we have been just looking at this piece, where there is an experiment, where the experiment is just how you gather your data, right? So the measurement is your experiment. You have an experiment, you get data, you train a model that can have the least sum of squared errors on your data. This is what all of this module has been focused on so far. But it's a valid question to ask. Given that I already know that I'm going to train an RC model, I already know the structure, the mathematical form of the model, can I use that information to actually design an excitation experiment that will ensure that my model has the best properties to predict? So this is what we are trying to answer now. And this entire field is called optimal experiment design. So the entire field of model so, let me make it more formal. We want to find the input, the optimal input trajectory that will maximize some information or some characteristic of my model uh, subject to some constraints. Okay, so this is again a, a mouthful. So we can break it down. We will define some optimal criteria that applies to your uh, sequence of perturbation such that it maximizes some metric about your model. We already know what model parameters are. And the thing is that we are not just going to uh, come up with any solution. For example, in the, uh, in the air handling unit excitation, I have to always operate between, uh, let's say, uh, 0 and 4000 RPM. I should never actually touch the peak RPM of the fan itself. So there are some physical constraints within which you can design this experiment. That's what this means. All right, so, the, so let me give you an intuition, which is the most important part, and uh, we won't have enough time in the semester to go over the math, but my goal here is to inform you of this field, which you may not have even heard about, so that when you encounter such problems in your own models, you know what to look for. Right, so let me give you that intuition more than the mathematical maturity at this point. So let me look at our problem from a different perspective. I want to now explore what is the best data that will lead to the most optimal estimate of the parameters for my model. This is the experiment design question. What is the sequence of these inputs that can make my model estimation have the least errors in some sense. So to do so, we can think in terms of likelihood functions. These are a very powerful, this is a very powerful concept and it's used very often in machine learning as well. The likelihood in this context is the probability that you have observed some data conditioned upon the fact that you are assuming this data comes from your model. So that's like a philosophical uh, question here, so let me make it more refined. You are assuming that the building works using an RC model. This is your hypothesis, your assumption. This likelihood is trying to capture what is the probability of observing what you have seen in the inputs and outputs, conditioned upon the fact that your assumption is that this data has been generated from your RC model. We know that the building doesn't follow your RC simplified model, it follows some more detailed physics. But we, have, we can still define the likelihood function of the probability that we see this given observations subject to the fact that we assume this RC model. Right, so that's what is called the likelihood function. So let's think about what this function could look like. Right? So we are plotting the likelihood of observing some data subject to some models. What we would want is this function to have like a high peak or a well-defined peak around some optimal parameter estimate. So what this means is that if as a result of your estimation you land in the neighborhood of alpha star, then you are very well explained your hypothesis that your data is indeed coming from this RC model. Whereas in the neighborhood of alpha star, your hypothesis would be inconsistent. 
So if the likelihood function has this peak nature to it or a narrow high peak nature to it, this means that it is likely that you can recover a good estimate of your parameters provided that the data has enough information to, uh, to do so. So this is just a cartoon view of what this likelihood function could look like. It's not always guaranteed that this will look like this. In some cases, or in many cases, the likelihood function may not have a well-defined peak, or it doesn't have a peak which has very high likelihood at one point. So in this picture, this data can be explained not just by alpha star, but also in the neighborhood of alpha star. Right? Alpha 1 and alpha 2 are equally likely to explain this data, subject to your assumption. Therefore, what we would want is, first of all, given a likelihood function, we would want an estimate which maximizes the likelihood function. Okay? That's what we are trying to do. We are trying to find the peak in this likelihood function of how likely are you to observe this data subject to your model. So this estimate is, uh, no surprises for guessing, it's called maximum likelihood estimate. This is where the term maximum likelihood estimate comes from, if you've seen this before. It is trying to maximize the likelihood that you have observed this data subject to your assumption or your underlying model assumption. So we always want to maximize the likelihood function, but how do we ensure that our situation is similar to this one and not this one, right? Because here we have a high likelihood that our data is, uh, that our model assumption is correct because the data is coming subject to your you know, model parameter alpha, whereas here the likelihood function is more broad and distributed, so any alpha would work. So what we want is we want some way to quantify the difference between how quickly the likelihood function falls around its maximum. Right, so I see I have lost some of you at this point, so let me go ahead and complete this and then I'll pause again, okay? The likelihood function is telling me how, what is the probability that this data is coming from my model, where the model is just parameterized by alpha. What we would want is, if we have this likelihood function, we want to maximize this to figure out where is the highest likelihood of being able to explain that this data is coming from my model. But we also want to say something about the shape of this likelihood function, not just the maximum. So we want to say something about how quickly it falls around the maximum. As we've seen this before, this concept of curvature before, what we do is we look at the Taylor series expansion of the likelihood function. We approximate it by a quadratic. You've seen this trick before. When we want to maximize it, this derivative term is zero, so slope is zero at a maxima. So the only remaining term would be the second derivative of this likelihood function, which is the curvature of this likelihood function. And this quantity in statistics has a special name called Fisher information. What this is telling you is, how does the likelihood function decrease or change around the best possible values of the parameters which explain my data set. So here's, I promise, here's the last uh, definition that you will see today. And the good thing is that you always have access to these slides even after the course. So this is not part of your assignment, but I want you at least to know about this part of model identification. So we define Fisher information as a property of the likelihood function. It's simply the second derivative. Why do we define this? There is a result, a theoretical result, called the Kramer Rao inequality or bound. What it tells me is, if I have a set of measurements y, I can define the likelihood as the probability to observe data with respect to my model, which is the definition of a likelihood function. This theoretical result states that the errors or the covariance of your model parameters, which are alphas, is lower bounded by some information matrix, the inverse of some quantity i. What does it mean? It means that no matter what experiment you do, how you generate the data, you can never reduce your error of the parameters less than some theoretical bound, which is a property of your model itself. Okay? So, this theoretical bound is called the Fisher information matrix. 
which is simply the second derivative of the likelihood function. So don't worry about where this log came from. Uh, but this is consistent, right? So the second derivative of the probability of data given model, which is a likelihood function. So what is this telling you in plain English? Forget about this leak <laughs> on this slide. It's telling me if you, no matter what, what you do, your error of your parameters of the model can be no better than some property of the data that you have collected, which is what intuition also tells us, right? The, if your data is flat and has some less information, our models will have higher. The best you can do is reach this equality, theoretically, it's very hard to do. So this is what experiment design tells us. And just to make sure I close the loop on experiment design before we break today, we can do this for our state space models. And again, don't worry and get scared with the, with the math. We have a state space model that we uh, love and adore. It has some special terms with noise in this time that we haven't considered so far. But what I'm telling you is that for state space models, you can define this likelihood function as this expression. I don't expect anyone to follow where this is coming from. I'm just merely stating the fact that you can compute it for a state space model, where this quantity f depends upon the ABCD values of your of your state space model. I mean, don't worry about where this is coming from. So what 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 we can do is, if we can compute the likelihood function, we can also compute the second derivative of the likelihood function, which is the special information matrix. And here is where this is useful, that your information matrix only depends upon your data. It doesn't depend upon your parameters of the model. So it's a function of what data can you collect. So what Kramer Law has told us is you can do no better than the inverse of this matrix. Therefore, and I promise you this is my last slide, i made these promises many times, but this is a real life slide, okay? What this tells us is, we can now optimize different attributes about this data matrix that will give us what is the optimal, optimal sequence of inputs that you need to inject in order to get an even tighter lower bound for your paper. So, and again, plain English, what we want to do is, since we can compute this special information matrix, we can use optimizations like a trace is going to optimize sort of the longest length of this uh, information matrix. The determinant optimizes the ellipsoid volume of this matrix. So these have names called A optimal, D optimal experiment design. And what we do is we can define this information matrix for our state space model and optimize over the data y itself, which means we are trying to find some property of the excitation of the data that will make this right hand side of the Kramer bound even smaller, so that we have the highest chance to get a model which is as close as possible to the Kramer bound. And that in a nutshell is very big, fast, probably 90%, 50% of this is too much to include in five minutes, but the intuition is this is what optimal design is, right? So given a state space model, this is what allows us to figure out this optimal excitation trajectory so that the resulting RC network that you learn from this model has a higher accuracy than conventionally trained data sets. And so this is an entire field. The only take home message is if you ever encounter this problem that how do I make sure my input data has enough excitation so that my model is not getting generalized well. The keyword you want to Google is optimal experiment design. That's the takeaway. Okay? So I know this, this last part was a bit rushed, but uh, I wanted to really emphasize some real world building specific examples of the story doesn't end at parameter estimation. That's where we will stop because we have to move on to medical CPS and automotive CPS. So you will take away these principles of state space and parameter estimation, which are universal, uh, but there is more to this. And so the final piece of this first module is the model predictive control part. And we will uh, again see examples of how you actually use this model to be controlled. Okay? 
So uh, let me know if you have questions, but otherwise I will see you in the next lecture.